We are in week four of a series to help us kind of better grasp what it means to enter into relational interaction with the Trinity as the fourth. And I introduced a concept uh, two weeks ago called tension prayer spokes. They're like spokes in a tire or in a wheel in like, like, like that situation, any relationship has kind of these truths or realities that appear to be pulling in opposite directions, but they're actually trying to create tension to create balance in the relationship. And these truths are true on their own, but they are definitely not standalone truths, which is where I think I have gotten in the most trouble, and I, my experience is I think followers of Jesus get in the most trouble. We like to follow one of these or two of these at the chagrin of the others. But they are rather interdependent truths that require each other to make the wheel of relationship with each other, and in this case, more importantly, with God turn well. And their tension's not necessarily of stress, though I think they can create stress. They have in my life, at least. But rather, tensions to create Balance through truth. And we've looked at four of the eight so far. Probably the most important one is the first one, that prayer is an issue of faith. And what we said were just a couple things. First of all, faith with God is about movement on our behalf. It's about stringing together moments of faith. It is not about placing your emphasis on just a moment, but having a moment and looking for the next. God isn't looking, by the way, for recognition. He's quite aware and comfortable with who he is, with or without your recognition. Rather, he is looking for relational interaction. He's looking for something with us that reminds him of what the Father, the Son, and the Spirit share naturally all day long. And we also said it's about wrestling forward. It's about not accepting necessarily the unbelief you have, but wrestling through that unbelief to ask God for more. I believe, help my unbelief. Number two, prayer is not like interacting with humans. It is not about magic words. And we said two things last week. First of all, it's not about using many words. God does not need to be convinced through an essay especially because he already knows what you're going to ask before you ask him. That simplifies things. And it's also not about using strings of words like in his name. There's no magic genie in praying in the name of Jesus. Rather, what that means is I want to be in alignment with where Jesus is going and where he is at. God doesn't get triggered like we do on certain words. So let it rip when you pray. Number three, prayer has to do with God's will. There's a fun one. And for this one, we looked at a couple of things. First of all, we looked at two places in the Bible where Jesus showed us this in in Gethsemane right before he was arrested and died, and then the Lord's Prayer. And what we saw was Jesus praying two very specific things. Here's what I want, but I also want what you want. And if you go with one without the other, you will create huge imbalance in your understanding, and in your coming to the Trinity. And then we looked at two words that I think have really helpful, have been helpful to me at least. First of all, his ultimate will. God has an ultimate will for our complete wholeness and our complete restoration. God will make your life perfect one day if you bow your knee to Christ. Amen? The problem is, In the immediate moment, we don't know exactly what God is doing. And I would add to that, we also don't know what the enemy is doing. And on top of that, we don't know what humanity, who at times I would say has been handed too much free will by God, is going to do to affect all of those things. Bottom line, we have very little clue what God might be doing in the moment. But we know this, God is good And God is ultimately going to make us whole. So keep pressing on him. Keep coming. 
keep asking what I heard Andy ask last week as he was praying for somebody last week. It was, it was brilliant. He said, God, I know what you're going to do for this person out here. It's already destined. You will give them a new body. Would you be willing to move your timeline up? Isn't that a great prayer? Whoa, I was so moved by that. Here's what I want, but I want what you want. Number four, authority has been given to us. A third of the Trinity, a third of God himself, if you have bowed your knee to Christ for a split second, lives within you. You are clothed with power and authority, and they're not the same thing. So let's continue and let's do five through eight. We all ready? They get a little easier now. Number five, you don't have because because you don't ask. We know the well-known verse set in James 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you desire and do not have because you, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. We know the famous part of the verses. You do not have because you do not ask. But we always seem to leave out where those verses came from. You see, we all want and want and want and want and want, and then we just want more. That's who we are. And by the way, that is not necessarily bad. In fact, I would say it's mostly kind of okay. And I know it's okay, because nowhere in this verse string does it say, and shame on you for wanting. See, it says you covet doesn't say shame on you for coveting, which is really weird because isn't that a Ten Commandment? I don't know. You want, you want, so you murder. But he doesn't say, so you should stop wanting so you don't murder. That's not what he says. No. In fact, it says you have passions and desires and you want. I think he's kind of saying bully on you. That's awesome. You're just going to the wrong spot. Ask God. Meaning stop beating each other up to get the things you want. Stop climbing over each other to get it. Come to me, God says. Stop thinking everybody is obligated to make you happy. Boy, if we could figure that one out. Right? And I love this. In Isaiah 30, 18, it says this. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to, for, to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show how, his mercy to you. See, God is waiting on high for you to come and tell him what you want. I love the way Brian Fury translated this years and years ago. He said, God is sitting on the edge of his seat waiting to hear from you. And not just to hear from you. He wants to know what you want. Isn't that cool? If you have kids when they're little, it's really difficult. One of them, two of my grandkids can't talk. It's frustrating now as a, as a grandparent because I'm more aware to see they want, but they can't tell you what they want. And they get so frustrated because they can't explain it. And then that never stops because they become adults. <laughs> and they're trying to tell you what they want, and you still don't know necessarily but I want to know what my adult kids want, right? Of course I do. I am, I am convinced we do not see a lot of things that God wants to do simply because we're not asking him and we're protecting ourselves. To borrow on an earlier truth spoke, we don't know the immediate sense of what God is going to do, partly because we never asked him what he's going to do. So start asking. Remember, right? God's essence is a trinity of oneness. He doesn't do literally anything in life on his own. The Father and the Son 
and the Spirit do nothing. Can you, do you hear that? On their own. You will never find a place where one of them did something on their own, ever, without the other two's involvement. God loves the idea of co, C-O. God invented co, co co-participation, co-partnering, co-creating, co-building, co-laborating. How's that for a little twist of words? It wasn't even in my notes, by the way. Co-healing, co-restoring. Remember that little story I shared in April, if you were here. Hezekiah the king is going to die. And he asked God, could we extend this a little? And God gave him 15 more years tacked onto his life. Come and ask. And you know the most frequent question you've asked me from my four weeks in April and my two weeks so far? This, this fascinates me. How many times should I ask? You're the ones that keep asking me this. I don't know, but if you don't know, Ask it again. Paul knew after three times. I don't know how he knew that. I think he knew it because God said, that's enough. Like, I ain't doing it. But that's one example. That's the only example I know. Keep coming. Number six, bring others in. There's this interesting little thing that gets introduced in the Old Testament, and it goes something like this. And God heard their cry. Now, as we just said, there's a ton of times where it says God heard his cry or God heard her cry, like the hemorrhaging woman that I shared, right? And as I mentioned that, immediately you should be flooded with all kinds of examples of individuals that prayed, you know, to God and, and, and God heard them. But we also hear, and God heard their cry. In the famous scene in Exodus with Moses, Exodus 3, it says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry. In Psalm 106, the psalmist basically, it's really fascinating. You might write it down to read it later. In Psalm 106, the psalmist basically recounts Israel's just massive mishaps over and over and over, getting themselves into trouble, and at the end, of the exhausting list of waywardness by Israel, this is what it says in Psalm 106. Many times God delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless, ah, this is what I need. I need a bunch of neverthelesses. He looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. A bunch of screw-ups that couldn't get their faith right. And God says, nevertheless, they cried to me. What that really means is their cry, their reach, it reached God's ears every time they were stuck in a corner, by the way, of their own doing, which I think is also fascinating. Remember in April, we looked at how David spoke of Moses when God was going to wipe Israel out. And he told Moses, I am so sick of these people. They drive me crazy. Take a a step to the left so I can point my finger and take them all out. And the Psalms say that Moses stood in the breach, that's the phrase, on behalf of Israel. Moses changed God's mind by standing in the breach. Now again, Just like an earlier spoke, this is not magic. This is obvious. God is a trinity of oneness, and we are joining in their oneness. See, it's about relational oneness when we bring others in and come to God. It is not about overwhelming God with numbers. Do you hear that? If you get three people to pray with you, and you think, gosh, if I had six, God would hear us better. I know you thought that because I have too. You're not going to overwhelm God with numbers. You're going to overwhelm God with relational togetherness. Isn't that beautiful? Romans 15, that together, Paul says, you may with one voice 
glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that word glory simply means the actuality of God. It means God for who he is. We want to see God for who he is. When we have one mind, and here it is, when we have one voice for each other, we make God obvious to the world. We are acting like them. We don't wear God down in numbers. We gather more to participate more to replicate the Trinity. When we pray for each other with one voice, and mind you, this is my opinion, but I will share it with you because I have the mic. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the same time. We are living out the life of the Trinity when we have one, one mind and one voice. I get this all the time. People assume that I'm this massive extrovert. We were at a dinner party last night, and I was having a grand old time. And when I haven't having a grand old time, I get loud. Right, Jackie? I was enjoying people and food. You can't, you can't bring two things together and all centered around Jesus. Like, that is the Mecca to me. That is just beautiful. But I am not really an extrovert. I am more of like what, you, what people say is an extroverted introvert, right? Praying out loud is not my sweet spot. It just isn't. I'm 60 years old. Believe me, if it hasn't caught wind by now, I'm not sure if it will. And to be honest, I don't really see the idea of praying out loud pushed in Scripture. Uh, I'm for it. I'm definitely not against it. I see people have the gift of doing that, and then they're very comfortable with it. I'm not necessarily, and it's not necessarily a theology that I see all over Scripture, right? What I do see, however, is being of one mind and one heart and one voice and coming to God persistently on behalf of each other. See, the idea is let's stand in the breach for each other. Let's act like them. And you know what? I've never seen a church that is more like this in my life. The mark of a healthy church could be small groups. That's a cool thing. Could be healthy theology and teaching. That's a cool thing. The music and the worship, cool thing. You know what I think the greatest sign of a healthy church is? It's when this service gets done. And if you sit in here, for 30 to 45 minutes to an hour. And you, in fact, I invite you to do this if you're new here, if you haven't done it. Just go find a corner where no one's going to bug you. By the way, they're going to bug you. They're never going to leave you alone. And just watch. Watch the groups of people loving each other, encouraging each other, connecting, and then just huddling to pray for one another. They're standing in the breach. Isn't that awesome? That's this church. Number seven. I think this one's cool. Familiarity with the holy. This is another one of those kind of beautiful truths that lie in tension with one another. Two truth tensions that we must hold simultaneously to create the proper balance. And as I go through this, you have to fight the urge to say, yeah, but. I know you're going to want to say, yeah, but. But there's actually two things pulling. We briefly mentioned this in April when we talked about God being rigid and flexible at the same time. Here they are. First of all, you are welcomed as the fourth within the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And welcomed is just a terrible word. I don't even know why I put it. You belong. You belong there. You're not visiting somebody's house when you're in the presence of God. You're not staying while you're allowed. You're not paying rent. You have been washed by the blood of Christ. You are a blood relative of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen? The table is your table. You have a specific seat. When we grew up, we had, we had four kids and two parents. And I know that sounds weird. And we had a seat. Right, Mom? I had a seat. Nobody sat in my seat. It was my seat. God forbid, I, I, the, the thought never occurred to me to go sit in my mother's seat or my father's seat. I loved my seat because I was one seat away from my father's hand. It was excellent. And my mother's hand was much more gentle, much more gracious, much more soft. 
So I'd like to sit down at the end next to my mother. It was also closer to the garbage can because I used to throw my peaches out because I didn't like peaches. I'd drop them in my napkin. So it was a very strategic seat. I don't know why I shared that with you, but it was very important to me as a kid because you have this kind of place in the Father's house. You have a seat. Isn't that cool? You belong. And yet, one of them's not like the other. You are not like them. And if that's news to you, you need a psychiatrist. So let's take these one at a time. First of all, we are welcomed as the fourth within the Trinity. Again, I introduced this in April, but I want to kind of explore this a little more depth. When Jesus died, at the very moment, the massive veil that existed within the temple, within the Holy of Holies, within the Jewish temple itself was torn, right? The Holy of Holies is referred to in the Old Testament. It, it's it's, it's th this place where God's presence was, right? Where God was enthroned. And once a year, only once a year, the high priest, the Jewish high priest, would go behind the veil to offer something to God. And the veil was there to remind people that God was holy and they were not. They were anything but God. God's presence was there. And the high priest, once a year, had to be cleansed so that he could go behind the curtain for a few moments. It was this massive physical barrier representing the massive barrier the massive difference between the Holy One and humanity. The veil was 60 feet long, 30 feet wide. And early tradition says that it was four inches thick. I mean, that's, that's a lot of cloth. They said it took 300 priests to manipulate the veil because of the weight. You didn't just stumble behind the curtain. If you wanted to go behind the curtain, there were hordes of priests just to crack the veil to allow you to sneak in, having been cleansed as the high priest for a few moments and get the heck out. And this is what we read at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in 27. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. And notice to me, this is so beautiful. The curtain, it says, why this detail? Was split from top to bottom. It's as if God himself, and he did, by the way, tore it from heaven to earth. He is fighting his way to us. Do you hear that? What a scene. And the beauty is now we have access to God's presence. Not by a human high priest once a year for a few minutes, but as Jesus enters as our own personal high priest. Not through a curtain, but through the Holy Spirit who clothes us and wraps us around the presence of God permanently. Later, the writer of, the Hebrew, of Hebrews makes this so clear in Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence now, meaning the high priest was not confident. I think he was shaking in his boots even though he was cleansed. Like, I hope that cleanse worked. But that's not us. We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us now draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We need to hear this. We can confidently turn to God. Jesus paved the way for you. Jesus paves the way for you. The translation is, we belong in the presence of God. He is a blood relative. You have a seat 
at the table. There is no shame. There is no room for guilt. The veil in the temple was a constant reminder for Israel that sin renders humanity unfit for his presence, but no more because of Jesus' blood. Hebrews 4, let us then with confidence, there's our word again, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. Mercy and grace is now behind that curtain. Mercy and grace to help in time of need. That word confidence means bold freedom. Jesus, if you know him, is your brother. The father, it says in the New Testament, is your Abba. He is your dad. As my father used to say to me all the time, even when I didn't deserve it, by the way, and I mean mostly when I didn't deserve it, before I really, really had even decided, I was like, I'm all in. I was just toes in. My dad would say to me, you can look him in the eye, son. You belong there. Oh, that filled me up. You belong with God. And yet, he ain't you. This should be obvious. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet had a vision where he sees the throne of God for but a moment. And this is what he describes. In the year of King Uzziah, that he died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, of his reality. And the foundation of the threshold. I read that this morning and it dawned on me. I thought it would say, and the foundation of the angels. The foundation of the created beings that were around him, but it doesn't. It says the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him. The rocks were quaking at the sight of God. And the house was filled with smoke. I can't even imagine this. I've had encounters with God that just undid me. I have never had this. I can't fathom this. And neither could Isaiah, by the way, because this is what Isaiah went on to say. Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell This is where he talks about his friends. I'm sure they appreciate this. In the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Literally, what he's saying to God is, woe is me, I am undone. Do you know what the word means? It means destroyed. I glanced at you and it destroyed me. It was so beyond me. He evaporated in front of God. This is the same God that has you call him brother and Abba. And when you get that worked out, come explain that one to me. Over and over and over in the Old Testament, the neighboring cities and nations are said to be terrified of God because of his great acts. Creation reacts the same way, by the way. In Psalm 77, When the waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you, O God. When the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. So what do we do with this dichotomy? We hold both truths in tension with one another. We let them pull us to the proper place. Hebrews 4, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. See, coming to God is the ultimate place of grace, but never make a mistake. It's a throne. We know we belong, and yet we are not like the Father, the Son, or the Spirit. To the extent that you are able 
to swing the pendulum in your heart and mind of his holiness. It will determine the length that the pendulum will swing the other way on your understanding of his grace. Does that make sense? You barely grasp his holiness, you will barely grasp how gracious he is to you. You barely grasp his holiness, you will barely grasp how amazing it is that you have a seat at his table. Does that make sense? It's okay, let him swing. It's that famous scene, I can't remember what his name was, the pastor, I've shared this before, I think he was in Texas, and he's finished preaching, and he said to his congregation, let's pray. Silence. A minute went by. That's a long time waiting for a dude to pray. Nothing. Minute two, nothing. Minute three, nothing. Now people are looking up because they're not sure he's still alive. And when they peek at him, he's still bowed in prayer. And then, with a soft voice, he says, forgive us when we rush into your presence. The same presence that gave you a seat for eternity at the table. Now, number eight. This is the coup de grace. And by the way, it does not wash the other seven out. Because it's not a standalone truth. But wow, is this one great. The Spirit is praying on your behalf. Now for the pressure remover of all pressure removers. In his letter to the Roman church, Paul shares this experience that all of creation has. In Romans 8, this is what Paul says. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pain of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but humanity, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what is Paul saying? We are all in pain. And not just humanity, creation is absolutely in pain. There's not a time when someone walks in this room, not a single, where a single individual doesn't have something on, going on in their life. That's what this world is like. The world is dark and simply works against us, all of us. Our days are tough. Our lives are tough. Our mental process is tough. Life is literally working against creation. This is the reality that God's creation is in, and we groan, Paul says. And so what's God's reaction to this? Let me read on in Romans 8. Likewise, most important word, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for the English language. And he knows and excuse me, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, this is really cool. And let me just highlight this in a couple of ways. First of all, that word likewise. Likewise to what? We are in pain. We're groaning. The all of creation, we're, we're feeling the weight of this life. And likewise, the Spirit is groaning right alongside you, but not for himself. See, we're groaning for each other and for ourselves. The Spirit is groaning for you. The Spirit, when we give our lives to Jesus, the Bible says, enters within you and dwells with you and walks with you. In the New Testament, the Spirit plays all kinds of these really cool roles in your life. The Spirit comforts us. The Spirit leads us and guides us. The Spirit reminds you of truth. The Spirit teaches you the truth. The Spirit encourages. You know the word that's within encourage? It's called courage. The Spirit is placing courage within you to continue on. The Spirit teaches and reminds us constantly of what is true, who God is, what God is like, how God feels about you, what he wants for you, 
how much he loves you and how committed he is to you. Why? Because he knows you. He dwells within you. He lives with you. He misses not a single split second of your life and what you go through. The spirit is, who is outside time, in, inside you still enters into the continuance of time to feel for you and to hurt for you and to listen to you and to empathize with you and to groan over you. And the result is just pain for the spirit. This is what he signed up for. Can you imagine the three of them cooking this whole thing up? And the spirit goes, ooh, 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 I have one. Here's what I'd like to do. Really? I'd like to go dwell inside of them, to walk with them, to feel them. Can't you imagine the father and the son saying, dude, you know what you're getting yourself into? Yes. This is what I do. So deep are the groanings. His complaints sound like moans, the Bible says. And even then, he is expressing that to the Father and the Son. And second of all, he's not just praying. He's praying on behalf of you. He's not, what I would do, is if I was inside of you, I'd be saying, Father and Son, get me out. This is too much. But he's not. He's there for you. He isn't moaning like some sad victim. He's actually, he knows way more than we even know about where we're at. He knows way more about what the father's heart and the son's heart is too. And he's interceding for you. He is praying for you night and day. I think this is just nutty. See, God in the essence of the person of the Spirit is praying to the Father and Son. God is praying to God on your behalf. And why? Because you really don't know how. Isn't that great? For me to end the whole first three weeks on prayer and letting you know, by the way, don't think you have a clue how to do this. No sermon series is going to really fill you in so you got this whole thing down because you know that much. I loved what Tim prayed a couple months ago when he was praying for somebody up here. He said, Father, I don't even know what and how to pray about this. That's an honest prayer. You know what he's really praying? Because he knows his Bible. Spirit, I need you to fill in some gaps here. I'm going to fumble out what I want and I want what you want, but I don't even know what I'm saying. See, we work so hard when we pray. What words do I use? What do I imagine? You ever do this? What do I imagine when I pray that I'm praying to? I think I know what is needed, but I'm not even sure. I believe, yet I don't. No problem. No matter what you pray, the Spirit is stepping in for you. God knows how to talk to God. Remember that previous wrestling. I know his ultimate will is for the wholeness and healing of everyone. I just don't know what's going on in the moment. No problem. He does. Do I pray, I expect you will, or I expect you can? No problem. The Spirit knows. And by the way, the very next verse in Romans is a verse that almost everybody knows if you've been in church. And he works all things to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know why I think that verse is there? You know partly why it's all working out for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Because the Spirit's praying the right thing for you. The Spirit, the verses say intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I just find this so comforting. So, let it rip. Ask. Keep asking. Stand in the breach for each other. Crumble in awe before his mighty throne and yet come boldly and look him in the eye. Do not cower. 
even though you know, even though you know, even though you know you are not like the other. Knowing that he knows what you really need. He knows what we all need. He knows the great courage it takes to live in the pregnancy of the now, waiting for the then. Let's pray. Keep thinking of those words when Jesus resurrected and he appeared to the disciples and Thomas said, you know, can I, can I feel your hands and touch the hole in your hands? I just, gotta, I just gotta know. And he said, sure, like, no problem. I get that. I get you need that. And then you said, Jesus, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still fight forward in, in their movement of faith. That's who we are. We can't see you physically. We can't smell you physically. We can't touch you physically. We can't read your facial expressions. We work on trust and what you've told us in your word is accurate. And while we cling to that, the world tells us it's all nonsense. And the enemy fights for our attention. While we wrestle with you, you're so proud. I can just feel that. Oh, holy one of Israel. Thank you that each of us that have bowed our knee to your son, have a place at your table, our seat. No one dares sit in it. And Father, for anybody here that is still wrestling with what to do with you, what to do with your son, I pray that you would meet them now, that they would realize in this moment, you would help them realize in this moment, all they need to do is recognize your son for a moment and you will never get over it and for this we worship you and sing to you today all God's people say